My father was abusive, he was an alcoholic, and my mom came to this country as an escape from my father. So she immigrated to this country when I was one year old in 1980. You know, my, my origins are very humble, especially my mother's and grand, grandparents and uncles. Their first job here in the United States was picking strawberries and celery and tomatoes. Eventually my mother, because she's a hard worker, she, she would take it upon herself to enroll herself in ESL classes. And she learned enough English to get a job at a gas station and she would ride her bicycle for about two hours uh, at the wee hours of the morning just to go to work. So my mother early on became absent in, in my childhood, not because she wanted to, but because she had to go to work as an immigrant and to um, provide for, for me. In junior high, I started getting into trouble. The first time I'd ever been in juvenile high, I was 13 years old. Seeing what I saw in juvenile hall and seeing these young boys and how aggressive and violent they were and the respect and admiration that they received from the other boys uh, made me want to be just like them because those are your male figures, those are your male role models. Once you want to become a part of what's on the street, a young subculture that has everything defined for you, how to dress, how to talk, how to act. You have to be a certain way or you're gonna get rejected. You know, the social norms become very rigid. Not having any family myself, I became very devoted to that lifestyle. That's all I cared about. Every day we, we'd steal multiple cars. I was getting arrested and going in and out of juvenile institutions. So my mom comes to visit me one day and she says, come on, I'm going to go enroll you in college. I said, college? She said, yeah, well, you got your GED, you're 17. And I was still telling her, Ma, come on, I didn't go to high school. What makes you think I'm be good at college? She said, look, if you enroll in college, it'll give you an excuse to get out of the house and your probation officer won't be able to do anything about it. I was like, that's right. So eventually I just went to class to show up and to have an excuse to get, it out, get out of the house. We went to a liquor store that we always went to. We went straight to the back. My homeboy grabbed two cases of beer. I grabbed two cases of beer. We walked towards the counter and we just stared down the, the clerk. And this had worked a lot in the past where we would just stare him down and he'd look away and we'd run out and he wouldn't do anything. But I guess like every man, he, he got fed up He shot me through the back and I flew, hit the ground. The beer scattered all over the place. I knew right then and there that I was paralyzed from the waist down. And you would think that that was, that was it. That was when I changed my life. But uh, you know, identity, peer pressure, masculinity, these are things that are hard to do away with. So to me, coming out of the hospital, now being in a wheelchair, I carried a gun often because m my, my logic now was that I can no longer run away. Uh, if I'm attacked, I gotta shoot my way out of it. What's problematic with this type of thinking is that when you think it every day, eventually it's gonna happen. I found myself at a ha house party with my homeboys. We were confronted and we were outnumbered. I pulled my gun out and I shot one of the dudes. The police picked me up that night and they charged me with attempted murder. While you're being processed, you at some point go before a sheriff who, who gauges what your bail should be. And he's typing away into the computer and then he's looking over the counter looking at me and then he goes back to the computer and then looks at me again. And then finally he, he asks me, he says, are you in a wheelchair? And I said, yeah. And he says, are you in a wheelchair because you were shot? And I said, yeah. And he said, how do you think your mom feels knowing that her son who's in a wheelchair because he was shot is now in jail because he shot another boy? And at that moment, it's like he put a mirror up to my face and showed me the damage that I was doing. 
not to myself, but to my mother. So when my mom bailed me out, you know, I would begin pretty much the fight of my life. She gets me a couple good lawyers and we start going to court. And in the meantime, my mom enrolled me in another college. And uh, she enrolls me in the English 60 class. The teacher says, write about a life-changing experience. I'm like, oh, I could do that. And I came back the next class day and as she was dismissing everybody and I was rolling myself out, she told me to come back. And when she said, oh, bet, um, come here, I need to talk to you. A lot of negative ideas started going through my head. Like, this teacher's gonna tell me that I don't belong here. But when I came back to her desk, she hit me with the opposite. She said um, that it was some of the best work she'd read in a long time. Your grammar isn't that great, but you know how to tell a story. And then she asked me, where'd you go to high school? And I told her, well, I never really did go to high school. She said, well, then where'd you learn how to write? I said, well, the only writing I've ever done is writing letters to jail or writing letters from jail. She said, well, I hope you stay in my class because I'd like to learn more about you and I want to read more of your work. And that made me feel good. I swear to God, it was one of the best moments in my life because finally I was being recognized by a teacher and not being recognized for, you know, not doing well or for being a travies or something like that. She was taking the time to tell me, look, you're good at this shit. So I took her class and I remember I told my mom what she said and my mom was happy and she said, see, keep going. And with the encouragement of those two people, I was able to take that class, finish, take another class, finish. In the meantime, I was going to court, back and forth, going to court. And after about two years, my lawyers, they had a deal with the DA. And the judge came out, said, you know, you'll be doing 12 years prison time? I said, yes, sir. He said, all right, come back in three months, at which point you will be taken into custody. Monday morning, my mom woke me up after that last court day, and she said, get up, you gotta go to school. I said, Mom, why I gotta go to school? I only got three more months of freedom. And she said, well, as long as you're free, you're going to school. I said, all right. So I got up and I went to class like usual. Eventually those three months came around and the judge gets up there and he says, you know, I'm not gonna send this young man to prison today. He said that he was taking it upon himself to instead of sentencing me to prison, to give me five years probation. And he said, the reason I'm doing this is because I was going to school and I was set to graduate within months. And the judge said, I see something other than just a boy who has committed a crime, right? I see a boy with potential here to do something else with his life other than what he has been doing with his life. I, if I send you to prison, you're never gonna graduate. But if I don't send you to prison, are you gonna graduate? And I was like, hell yeah, I'm gonna graduate. And yeah, I went to my classes, and two years after graduating with my bachelor's degree, I got my master's degree in literature with an emphasis in medieval literature. I've been an English professor ever since, and I really owe much of that to the judge who decided not to send me to prison, but of course, most of it to my mother who just never stopped believing in me. I'm lucky in that sense that my mother knows the value of education and she knows how it can transform people. Uh, and you know, that's what I try to instill in my students now. You know, the, the value of education, how it could change you. And not to be successful money-wise, to make you rich, but to make you a better person or to make you a whole person. I did so many terrible things in my, in my life, being such a mean gangster and hardened drug addict and all that stuff. And now I want to live my life so that I can be remembered as a good man, as a good artist, somebody that tried to reach out and help others, you know? 
especially like the work that I do in, uh, in the treatment centers now, you know, with the young heroin addicts. So, just somebody that tries to help.